Well, welcome to today's video. It's Saturday the 16th of May. Now, I want to look particularly today at a study from Spain examining serology. Now, the serum, as you probably know, is the liquid part of the blood. And serology really is the study of the antibodies that develop in the serum in the blood. And this is going to tell us some interesting things about what's going on. But more importantly, it's got a lot of practical implications. So we'll come on to that in a minute. Now, just before I go on to that, yesterday we were looking at the death rate in New York State. And quite a few people have helpfully uh, called in. Because what we were doing yesterday is we were looking at the, uh, the percentage of deaths in New York State. So, for example, it was 19% of the people that died were African-American. But African-Americans only represent 9% of the population. And while this is appalling, it wasn't surprising. It's consistent with data from other places in the States. And it's consistent with data from the UK. But what I did express surprise at was the Asian death rate. Because the Asian death rate in the UK has been higher, whereas higher than the general white population, whereas the death rate in Asians in New York State was the same, 4% of the deaths, 4% of the population. But as many of you have helpfully pointed out, the Asians in New York State are most from places like Korea, China, Japan, they're from Eastern Asia, whereas most of the Asians in the UK are from the Indian subcontinent, from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So slightly different uh, ethnicities there and making that comparison invalid. So many people pointed that out and uh, I'm grateful for that because I wasn't really aware of the ethnic Asian makeup of uh, New York State. So always good to get that sort of feedback. Now, just before we look at Spain today, Thailand, uh, no new cases or deaths reported, malls reopening. And, and remarkably encouraging picture from Thailand, it has to be said, all through basically uh, fairly basic community health interventions. So this is encouraging, but there's no international flights as of yet, as you would expect. And of course, Thailand uh, d does depend very much on tourism. But in terms of domestic uh, increases in rates of infection and deaths in Thailand, that looks like good news. Now, India uh, continues to concern me. Millions of people have been stranded who are in the informal sector and they've been stranded in cities where they're working and they can't get back to their villages. And hundreds of thousands are walking home. Now, the government did put some trains on, but they haven't been adequate. So what we have is a lot of people moving out of the cities into the countryside in India. And that is concerning because this is the trend we've seen in many places around the world where the infection has been in cities and has spread out to the country areas. And while we're in that part of the world, an alarming report I heard yesterday was that the first case has been formally diagnosed in a refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar. Now in Cox's Bazaar, there's a lot of Rohingya refugees from Burma, uh, Myanmar, and there's been a confirmed case there. And we did look at this last week that we're very concerned about this because of the high population density in these camps in Cox's Bazaar in southern Bangladesh. So I'm very worried about the virus spreading through that refugee situation, potentially spreading rapidly. Let's hope that this is an isolated case and that they're able to uh, contain it. Now, Arizona in the United States, now I'm just taking Arizona as an example, uh, lifting some restrictions, as in many states. <clears throat> um, the governor said it's a green light to proceed, not to speed. So he says he's opening with uh, reopening with caution. But 80 percent of the population of Arizona think it's too early. And I agree with the 80 percent. So the reopening in Arizona and in other American states is going to cause more cases. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't see how I possibly can be. So um, cause for concern there as many states start to progressively reopen. That will increase the r naught, and more people will get infected. Let's hope it's within manageable limits. 
Um, Australia as well. Now, Australia, New South Wales, for example, reopening. But um, the cases are much more controlled in Australia. So again, Australia, like New Zealand, has done remarkably well. So the reopening in the case of New South Wales, much more justified than in the case of Arizona, for example. Now, Iran, I haven't really accepted the data coming out of Iran. I think there's way more cases than are being acknowledged in Iran. And they are admitting to clusters of cases in uh, different regions. So whereas um, a lot of the cases have been in cities in the past, there's now clusters occurring in new regions. And this is the way it goes, of course. It goes from individual cases to clusters to community spread. So the likelihood of community spread in many regions in Iran is concerning with widespread contagion being possible in the Iranian situation. Now, in the UK, the Isle of Wight, IOW, Isle of Wight, more than half the people have downloaded in the, uh, in the Isle of Wight have downloaded this app already, which is very encouraging because that's going to alert people if they've come into contact with someone who has potentially got the disease. And the Isle of Wight is the pilot area for all of the UK. So we are going to get some sort of app sooner or later, I believe. And the Isle of the people of the Isle of Wight, well over 50 percent of people have, uh, have welcomed that and downloaded it already. So personally, I find that encouraging. Now, the UK um, have said uh, the Department of Health have said, and let me just show you directly what they've said. Um, coronavirus update. There's been some news reports about vitamin D reducing risk of coronavirus. However, there is no evidence that this is the case. And they carry on with their recommendations to consider 10 micrograms. There is no evidence that this is the case. Well, if you've been watching this channel, you'll know that there's mountains of evidence that this is likely to be the case. OK, we can't say definitively because there's not a double blind randomised controlled trial. But the weight of evidence is, in my view, overwhelming. And why my government doesn't get with this idea and potentially save lots of lives, I have no idea. So that was very disappointing to see that coming from my, uh, from my Department of Health. Time will tell, but uh, if you've been watching this series, I think you'll probably be convinced by the evidence that we've given already. Now, Italy's the borders are reopening from next month uh, within the Schengen zone and uh, a gradual reopening there is continuing. Now, um, there is concern about cases traveling throughout Europe and, and, and some will no doubt. So as things reopening are reopening, there will be some more cases. Let's hope it's let's hope it remains limited. Now, the main thing I wanted to do today was look at this study from Spain. And this was the, the first, it's the, the study is actually in two parts. The first part was published by the Spanish authorities this week. And now what they did was they took blood samples from nearly 70,000 people in different parts of Spain. So this is a very good sample size. 70,000 is a very, very good research number. The data is very likely to be highly valid. And they took a representative sample from different parts of Spain. So this is a good sample using good research technique. Therefore, the results are also likely to be valid. And it's what they call a prevalence study. Now, the prevalence is the amount of something in the community. So this is a prevalence study to look at the prevalence of the antibodies made to the virus in the community and of course you probably remember that the antibodies are the immunoglobulins and these are made in response to the virus this is why we get better so you'll get the viral infection you'll then make the antibodies the antibodies will get rid of the infection but then the antibodies will be left in the blood for a period of time we don't know how long yet probably a year or two years, we're not really sure, but they can be detected in the blood and that tells us where the infection has been and who has had the infection. So it's a prevalent study for the antibodies and it's a, an official study in Spain. And the result is interesting and it has to be said somewhat surprising. 
The result is that 5% of the Spanish population have been exposed to the virus. Now, given the problems that this virus has caused in Spain, this is a disappointingly low number. But that's what it's saying. So when they extrapolate up to this, from this 70,000 to the whole population, they say that 5% of people in Spain have been exposed to the virus or infected by the virus. Disappointingly small number. Now, the number does vary quite a bit depending on the province of Spain. So different provinces, and I'm not that familiar with these provinces in Spain, but different provinces have got different prevalence rates. So Syria province, 14.2% of people had antibodies indicating they've been exposed to the virus. In Madrid, Madrid, a little bit surprising it's not higher in Madrid. Other epicentres like New York, it's looking like over 20% of the population have been exposed. But Madrid, which was an urban epicentre, we're only looking at 11.3% of the population in Madrid. So smaller than we would expect. And other areas, only 2% of the population have antibodies indicating a low level of exposure to the virus. Now, the numbers that the study is quoting in their results are for the IgG, IgG. Now, this is the antibody, so IgG. So Ig stands for immunoglobulin. So immunoglobulins are the immune proteins, but we normally call them antibodies. So an antibody and an immune globulin is exactly the same thing. And these types, the studies quoting is for IgG antibodies. Now, the significance of this is that when someone is first infected with the virus, the first antibodies they will make are the immunoglobulin type Ms. So they will make the IgM first. And these are made within days of someone becoming symptomatic. And then, after that, the body will make the IgGs. So first we make the IgM antibodies, the, the immunoglobulin type Ms, then we make the immunoglobulin type Gs. This is more, if you like, a delayed response, but we believe a longer lasting response. So this is kind of the immediate antibody, and this is the one that develops later. And the study was looking for IgGs. Well, it was looking for both, but it was quoting the IgG numbers. In other words, this is people who had the infection usually some weeks ago. So it's taking into account the history of this outbreak in Spain. So the IgGs take longer to seroconvert. Now, seroconvert means the time it takes for the serum of the blood to become positive in this case for the immunoglobulin type G. But of course, that's a highly specific immunoglobulin to the COVID-19 virus. And by the time someone has got IgGs, it indicates absence of infection because the antibody will have eradicated the infection. So that means these people were no longer infected. Now, the study also tested for IgMs, which it found, as we said, these are made first, but it was the IgGs that they quoted in their data. So again, a very relevant, good way to, to study this. Now, 5% of the population of Spain are already infected, but herd immunity needs 70% of the population to be infected. Now, if Spain had not taken any lockdown measures, 70% of the population would have become infected and then the virus would have stopped spreading and further people would not have become infected. But this probably would have cost 277,000 lives. Now, that is my figure, and I want to justify to you why I'm giving you that figure. Because this is going to be very useful for working out similar problems in other countries and other parts of the world. Now, what I did here was I took the population of Spain, which is 47 million. So 47 million people in Spain. 
5% of that population were infected. And 5% of 47 million is 2,350,000. Now, as of last Wednesday, when this data was collected, there had been 27,459 deaths in Spain. So this is the number of people actually infected. The 5% of the population. This is the number of deaths. So this allows us to calculate the infection fatality rate. Because... Before, we didn't know the number of people infected, but of course it was many greater than the number of people diagnosed. So that allows us to calculate the infection fatality rate. So what we want to know is what percentage of um, 2,350,000 is, is 27,459. So we just do a simple percentage sum. So we find out that that is 1.16% of that. So what we know in Spain now is from this sample of 70,000 people that indicates that 2.35 million people have been infected in Spain. We know the number of deaths, therefore we calculate the infection fatality rate to be 1.16 in Spain. Now this infection would have gone on until it affected 70% of the population, then herd immunity would have developed. And 70% of 47 million is 32,900,000 people. So 32 million, 31 million people would have been infected in Spain. That would have reached the 70% required for the herd immunity. And then the infection in Spain would have stopped at that point. But that means that if 1.16% of this 32, nearly 33 million people had died, sorry, seven, so that's 70% of the 47 million, 32, 33 million people. Now, if 1.16% of those had died, that would have given us that figure, 1.16% of the 32 million is... 277,240 uh, potential deaths in Spain. And that's interesting because that gives us the case fatality rate in Spain. Well, no correction, it gives us the infection fatality rate in, in Spain. Before we were working on the case fatality rate, now this is the likely infection fatality rate. And of course, the infection fatality rate is going to be lower than the case fatality rate because more people get infected than we know about. So that is looking at the likely situation in Spain at the moment. So it looks like overall in Spain, we're looking at a 1.16 infection fatality rate in Spain. Now, what it is not valid to do is extrapolate this to the whole world's population. And the sun's come out, which of course is nice, but it gets in the way. Now, the world's population is 7.6 billion. 7.6 billion people. And for global herd immunity to develop, 70% of those would have to become infected. And 70% of 7.6 billion is 5.32 billion people. Now, what that means is if the case fatality rate is similar to the case fatality rate in Spain and 1% of people die, that means without mitigation measures, this pandemic could have killed 53 million people. If it turns out that the infection fatality rate is lower at 0.5%, it could kill 26 million people. These figures, of course, are completely unacceptable, so we have to have mitigation strategies. 
But what continues to concern me is that these are the sort of fatality rates we could be seeing in poorer parts of the world. Now, again, I've had a lot of criticism for saying this because, of course, the population of Spain is much older than the general population of the world. In many poorer areas of the world, the population demographic is often very young. And we know that young people die less frequently from disease. That would make the, from the COVID-19 disease, that would make the infection fatality rate much lower in countries with a lower population average age. And that's true. But also we have to remember that in many of these countries, some of the people that get sick aren't going to get good quality health care. So that's going to increase the case fatality rate. And what we don't know is how much the effects of pre-existing disease like HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, dengue fever, just to name four random diseases that are endemic in these areas. We don't know how much they're going to increase the case fatality rate. And I think as an estimate, the younger demographic of poorer countries is probably going to equal the increased risk from these other infections and from malnutrition and from poor health care. So I hope I'm wrong, but it is still possible that the overall death rate in the world could be round about 1% or between 0.5% and 1%, which gives these unthinkable numbers of uh, potential fatalities from from this pandemic so as we remember the uh, the case fatality rate is the proportion of deaths compared to the total number of people diagnosed but the infection fatality in in, in, <laughs> the infection fatality rate is the proportion of deaths to the actual number of infections and before we haven't known the actual number of infections, whereas now we've got much more insight into this through this large Spanish study. And in Spain, as we've said, the infection fatality rate is 1.16%, higher than we had hoped. Now, to be fair, let's give counter argument to this. Uh, I've just checked today in the University of Oxford estimate uh, global uh, case fatality rate to be half a percent. And they further estimate the infection fatality rate to be way lower at 0.1 to 0.26 percent. That's what they estimated. But I think that these estimates were arrived at before the arrival of the Spanish data. So the Spanish data could well increase these estimates because there are so many caveats and provisos. But it just seems interesting to me that we've now got this definitive data or fairly definitive data from Spain showing the amount of people actually infected in Spain, allowing us to calculate these things much more accurately. Now, where does this Spanish study fit in with other comparable studies around the world because there have been other uh, antibody studies in other places so for example in Geneva uh, the infection fatality rate again from antibody serological studies showed that in Geneva in uh, Switzerland 9.7 percent of the population had that says was had been infected in the past and 0.5% of these died. So that will give an infection fatality rate of 0.5 for Geneva. Again, a sophisticated country with good healthcare provision. Without good healthcare provision, that would have been higher. Heisenberg in Germany, the infection rate from antibody studies was found to be 14%. And the case fatality rate, there was 0.4%. Again, Germany, a very sophisticated country. Now, New York City, um, the 3,000 people that were tested in New York State, 
I think the figure in New York State was around about 14%, but for New York City, 21% tested positive for antibodies, and that gives an infection fatality rate of 1.1%, so quite a bit higher than the European ones. And in the UK at the moment, we estimate there's probably 6.5 million people infected, and that works out at an overall infection fatality rate of 0.5%. So what we're seeing is uh, infection fatality rates of 0.5% roughly in Europe to 1.1% um, in the United States and 1.16% in Spain. So that is the uh, infection fatality rates we may well be looking at. Let's hope that the younger demographic in many poor areas of the world protects those populations but as I've explained, I'm concerned about these other factors which will tend to increase the uh, infection fatality rate, particularly the lack of availability of health care. Now, just another couple of interesting findings before we finish today from this uh, study of 70,000 people in Spain. The infection rate in children. Now, of course, we know that the uh, morbidity rate in children is lower. We know that children don't get as sick. But this was really surprising because this is the infection rate. So less than one year it was 1.1%. That's suppo as opposed to 5% in the general population. One to four years it was 2.2%. That's as opposed to 5% in the general population. And three to nine years of age it was 3%. That's supposed to 5% of the general population. Now this is surprising this is showing that children are actually less likely to get infected now what i've said in the past is i believe that children were just as likely to get infected as adults but of course much less likely to express symptoms and thankfully much less likely to get very ill not impossible but much less likely but this data is saying no no it's saying children are actually less likely to get infected in the first place. Or it may not be saying that. It may be saying that children get infected just the same as adults. But they're less likely to develop the antibodies because remember, of course, this was a study to look for the antibodies. So is it that children get infected less than normal? Is it that children don't make antibodies as much as adults do? At the moment, we don't know. And what I'm going to look out for is if these findings are duplicated in other studies around the world. If it is, then that means children are less likely, somewhat less likely, to get infected than adults. And that would be surprising. But if that's what the data says, that's what the evidence is pointing. And we follow the evidence wherever it leads. So the evidence we have at the moment is saying children are less likely to get infected as well as less likely to develop complications. That's what this data seems to show. Now, yesterday we looked at data from um, New York State and we said that the likelihood of men and women uh, suffering, complica uh, suffering complications was different. We know that men are much more likely to suffer complications and men are more likely to die. But likewise, this study shows that the infection rate is the same. So men and women are equally likely to get infected, but men are more likely to develop complications and men are more likely to die. So data here, fairly consistent with the data yesterday from New York State and uh, fairly consistent with data on the amount of people becoming infected in the UK. But the amount of people infected in the UK, it appears... Uh, a twice as great a percentage as in Spain. So interesting data starting to emerge there. Now, the second half of the study from Spain with more complete data is going to be published next week. So we'll look forward to that. But I think those are fairly logical deductions from this accurate data that we are now getting from Spain as we start to get a better handle on the nature of this pandemic. So that's us for today. We'll just uh, show a few pictures now from uh, 
people that have been kind enough to send pictures in to me. And you want to see that one? There we go. So this is John watching in uh, Canada on a very large screen. I think John's actually at work there in Canada, so I expect he does plenty of work at other times. So good to know you're watching in Canada, John. This is uh, Karina watching in Kent in the UK. Good to know you're watching in Kent. So that, to me, it's Southern England anyway. <laughs> Kent is Southern England, of course. So thank you for watching there. This is a cowl watching in the sunny island of Bermuda. So good to know that people are watching in the Caribbean or the Caribbean, depending on where you come from. This is Carol, who's working out in Washington State. Glad to see you're keeping fit, Carol, as you watch the updates. <laughs> That's that one with me and Wallace on, isn't it? That's a, that one. Quite funny, that one. <laughs> uh, this is Catherine watching in Ontario. So good to know you're watching in Ontario and also good to see you have a supply of vitamin D to hand. This is Charles watching in Dominica. So good to know you're watching in Dominica, Charles. Not quite sure what you're taking there, but I guess the cod liver oil is good. Can't see the other ones. I guess the vitamin D is good. Anyway, glad you're watching in Dominica. You are always welcome. This is uh, Colleen and I assume husband in Dallas. Sir, I'm sorry I don't know your name. But good to know Colleen and uh, husband are watching in Dallas. Last time I checked, Dallas was in Texas, although it seems to be raining there. Okay, fair enough. Uh, this is Jet and Nina, who watch faithfully from the Netherlands. Now, Jet and Nina have written to me. Um, glad to see they're watching on a huge screen, or not. <laughs> glad to see they're taking vitamin D. But uh, these two deserve quite a lot of congratulations because they have been watching from the start. And always good to watch as a family, so sisters watching there in the Netherlands. So thank you for that picture, Jet and Nina. Uh, this is Jo, and I believe Jo is a nurse, and I'm sure she works in Southampton. And I'm glad to see that the PPE there looks absolutely top-notch. Excellent. I'm so pleased to see you look well protected there, Joe, in Southampton. And thank you for sending that picture in. Interesting on uh, different grounds. I'm glad to see that excellent PPE. Ah, got a couple of photos from Tanzania. So I don't think this is Karen in the picture, uh, but Karen sent this in. So I don't know who this lady in the picture is, but I do know that her sewing circle have been making these masks, which is excellent. So I'm sorry I don't know your name, but thank you for Karen for sending it in. If you let me know your name, of course I will let people know and show your picture again. Ah, this is Laura, who is also a nurse in Barcelona. So, um, I know you've been working hard for the last few months, Laura, in Barcelona. Let's hope you are getting a, a lot of satisfaction from the, the lives that you are saving in Barcelona. And thank you for the picture. Oh, this is the other one I got from uh, Africa, from Tanzania. And this is the uh, the classroom in Tanzania. So I'm glad to see there's good social distancing. Um, to be fair, as long as it's not too cold or too hot, I would like to have seen the windows open. Because these windows are clearly shut and uh, 
that will reduce the quality of the ventilation. So if you're indoors, do have good ventilation. Although there's probably ventilation at the front, I can't see. But good to see that the social distancing is occurring there while lessons carry on. So that is good to see.